as we said, we're going to talk a little bit tonight about Power BI. It is a self-service BI set of tools. There's not one thing we can point to and say this is Power BI. So for that reason, if you're not ingrained in the Microsoft BI world every day like I am, it can actually be incredibly confusing. So that's my main objective tonight is to let you know what all of the different options are and know what to look for if you're thinking about utilizing it in your organization. Before we get started, how many people here would consider themselves predominantly Microsoft people? Okay, good, that's more than half. How many people would consider yourselves predominantly business intelligence people, developers? Okay, very few, and that's actually what I expected. So, in terms of questions, I only have about 20 slides, which, if you've ever seen me present, is sort of the opposite of what, you, what I usually do. I usually am very scripted. Um, we're gonna do the opposite of that, so feel free to bring up questions as we go along, because I think I've left enough time throughout to try to handle questions as they come up, or if you prefer to hold them, that's perfectly fine too. Um, in terms of background, I'm a solution architect at Blue Granite. We're a BI and data warehousing firm. So that means on a day-to-day -day basis, I'll do things like design a data warehouse, um, how, it's, how it's defined, the, the structure of it and so forth, what an ETL process will look like, what the reporting environment looks like, that sort of thing. So it's a broad umbrella of things that I do, which is why I like it. If you want a copy of these materials tonight, um, if you go to my blog, which is at sequelchick.com, there is a um, presentations and downloads page, and that's where you can find the uh, slide deck. So here's what I want to talk about tonight. First, what is Power BI? Then I want to do sort of a back and forth discussion about what the architecture looks like and show you demos. At the moment, we have four flavors, if you will, of Power BI. And that gets things a little bit confusing. So we're going to start progressively with the simplest piece and move towards the newest piece that's still just in preview and talk about some of the differences between them. And talk a little bit also about use cases and so forth. One of the big things I also wanted to talk about during this is the strengths and the shortcomings of this platform. I do this day to day, so I'm not a marketing person, right? So I'm going to tell you what I really think. And there's some things it does really well, and there's some things that it doesn't do really well, and I hope to um, include that as we go along. Any high-level questions before we dive in? One big caveat. The information that I'm giving you now is what I know as of now. This stuff is changing literally month by month. And as we progress, especially with the new stuff, they're going to be on a release cycle of weekly. So kind of always challenge yourself as you go forth on this. Is this, is this still current? Is this still correct? Because it is changing all the time. Drives me a little nuts, actually. Okay, so Power BI, it's not just one thing. It's not just one thing you install and configure and run. It's essentially a suite of tools to accomplish a number of things. So the, the things that it wants to do is help the data analyst acquire data, do some cleansing and shaping of that, and by that I mean things like concatenating columns, merging data sets, appending data sets, putting in if statements to tidy things up. If you have ever um, found yourself taking, say, once a month or once a quarter various files, and you do the same thing every month or every quarter to get those in just the right format that you want, that's what they're targeting, is helping you with those repeatable type light data cleansing type operations modeling the data. So as part of this, we have a data model. And then presenting it through reports and dashboards and that kind of stuff, and then a way to share it. So kind of all five of those goals are, are part of the, the Power BI platform. And the big kicker here is that it's targeted at data analysts. 
And as far as marketing from Microsoft goes, they say you can do BI without IT. And obviously, I am speaking from the lens of a BI professional, right? So obviously, I'm never going to quite agree with that. But really, truly, in reality, most of the time right now, it's IT that's building these models and building at least the initial set and then maybe turning it over to power users. So I'm not saying that you don't have people in your organizations that are industrious enough to figure this out on their own and do it, but it's a very small segment of people that this is targeting. So, um, yes? Yep, so the question is, what does that mean about monitoring of data? And essentially being aware of what's happening. And one of the things that I'm going to show you in the newest flavor of Power BI is this idea of personal dashboards. And the idea behind that is that you can keep an eye on the things that are most important to you on your personal dashboard and know, oh, I'm going to go take action on that piece of thing. So overall, the goals are use familiar tools, because Excel is a big part of this, and shorten the time that folks spend preparing the data and you know, reaching insights. You know. So to achieve those five things that we just saw, we have this myriad of tools, right? The four major add-ins to Excel, Power Query, Power Pivot, Power View, Power Map. You know, we all stumble over ourselves with all the power words these days. There's a teensy bit of overlap between some of them, but generally speaking, the big guy there is Power Pivot. He's your data model. He's the thing that we need in order to put reports on top of it. The thing here that's optional is Power Query. I'm going to show all this to you in a minute, but conceptually, Power Query is optional. So if you don't need to restructure your data, if you're just getting data straight from a gorgeous data warehouse that your BI folks are releasing, you can probably take the data straight into Power Pivot. But if you need to merge it up with some other stuff and, and do some cleansing and so forth, Power Query is great for that. Power View is the newest uh, reporting tool. I'll show it to you. It's much more um, dynamic and interactive than any other reporting tools we've ever had. And Power Map is a bit of a different animal Unlike the rest of the three add-ins, Power Map's actually owned by the Excel team. So you're going to hear me as we talk about going to some of these other um, platforms like Office 365 or this new Power BI portal. Power Map's never part of it. So it's, it's very much an isolated tool for Excel only. As far as presenting data, We've got Power View, Power Map, but we still have the good old Excel pivot tables, Excel pivot charts, cube formulas. So if you guys have ever used those, they are incredibly powerful. Um, and then there's this idea of Q&A. So what that is is Microsoft is releasing this natural language query engine. So users now are used to using a search engine to show me what I want, right? It's trying to run a report using that type of search engine type of, of language. And I'll show you what that is in just a second. So on this chart, you just saw essentially Power Query, Power Pivot, and the other ones are, are how that kind of lays out. The big learning curve for folks, if you do have power users, if you will, data analyst power users, quasi-semi-technical people that are trying to use this, the biggest part of the learning curve is Power Pivot. And that's because they need a data model. And you need to understand things like one-to-many relationships. And you need to understand um, various things in order to produce a data model that handles reporting well. And we, we are continually always recommending still using a star schema type of uh, setup for these data models. You don't have to, um, but it's, it's, it's optimal. Okay, so let me tell you these four flavors, and, and then we'll go into demo mode, which is a lot more interesting, I think, to all of you than, than the slides. So there's four ways that we could use Power BI right now. First one is just Excel only. Those four add-ins that I just mentioned, and you don't have anywhere else to deploy it or use it, and you're just using Excel by itself. 
Then the next thing that came around was um, SharePoint on premises. So essentially, if you've ever heard of Power Pivot for SharePoint or a Power Pivot Gallery, that's what I'm talking about here. Next thing, sorry. All right, how's that? Can you still hear me okay? I moved it away. You want me to go closer? See, I'm a rookie. Okay, how's that? Better? Okay, sorry. I think I was saying earlier, I think it's the fourth time I've been mic'd up, so I'm no pro at this stuff. Uh, so the next thing that came around, this was about a year ago now, was Power BI for Office 365. And it had some things in common with our SharePoint on-premises, but it was SharePoint online, part of O365, and it had a lot of things that were fundamentally very different. So that's choice number three. Choice number four, as of just last month, this came into public preview, so it's not a real live um, solution yet, but it will be within a few months, I think we're hearing. Now, there, there's not a real name for it that I've heard. So what we're hearing, it is the new Power BI or Power BI dashboards. And now, instead of the only authoring environment being Excel, there's a new authoring environment called the Power BI Designer. So now we have four things in the mix. So we're really, really hoping that some of this gets simplified as Microsoft is navigating this um, evolution here because it gets really, really confusing as you can see and a lot of how things stack up and what you can do in each environment is not exactly the same. So if you don't remember a lot of the details of what I talk about tonight, what I do want you to remember is if you're reading something online, be very, very careful that what you're reading applies to the environment that you're in. Okay, so Excel add-ins. Let's see what these look like. So just starting from the front end, if you will, I'm on just Excel worksheets. This first page is a table of contents type of a page with little hyperlinks to the individual pages. So, sorry. So what we're looking at here are some slicers and some pivot charts and got a couple of pivot tables over here. Some nice cube functions up here at the top. This is all really very standard Excel stuff that we've been doing for years, particularly if it's been um, querying and analysis services cube. Here's where things start to get new. So Power View inside of Excel is using Silverlight at the moment. And it's the more interactive type of tool. They call it a data discovery tool. So what Power View is not is the, the solution to do a fully formatted type of a report. Excel over there is still a little bit more suitable for that or if you can do it even full-fledged reporting services. This tool is much more about let's interact with the data and, and see what we can find. So this particular um, page here is, is kind of just illustrating, it's not, uh, it's just got this one chart on the page, and this is a slicer, and this guy over here is a slicer. And then we've got a field list over here, so very familiar type of uh, environment to, if you've worked with Excel pivot tables, in, with respect to the field list. At the top, across here are, um, these guys are acting like little filters. So one of the things PowerView tries to do is utilize visuals a little bit more. So it's really doing the same thing as a, as a drop-down filter, however, um, it, it's more visual in nature, which to me, if it, if it adds some meaning, great. If it doesn't, then we don't really need it. Yeah, I'm not seeing them either. So, um, so some of these tools are really young and are missing some functionality that you might wish you had. There's two reasons for that. A, that it's just young and it's not there yet. Or B, 
PowerView was de designed with one goal in mind, and that is no training for the user. So where in a tool like reporting services evolved to be so powerful, but yet have a learning curve, because you've got properties to control every possible little thing, a tool like PowerView is not that. So there's a lot of stuff, if, if you're anything beyond a casual user that you're gonna say, oh, but I want that, and, and that's just not the tool for the job. It's really intended for the casual user with no learning curve. So, pros and cons with that, obviously. Um, here, we've got a little map. So the maps inside of PowerView um, use the Bing um, mapping engine. And so, what we can do is, is drill down so you can see here if I uh, zoom in for you, that's not going to work so well. Um, we zoomed from a state to a metro area. And there's a whole uh, demo script behind this, but um, I'll kind of save taking the time there. But one thing that's really interesting, and hopefully you can see it on the screen, as I highlight on each one of these items in the legend, it's, it's highlighting the related data on the screen. So it's really kind of a, a more interactive tool in that regard. Um, the other thing that we can do is even highlight things like items inside of a pie chart, and it'll cross-reference these other items on the page and so forth. I've got another report that I'll show you here in a minute that'll highlight that a little bit more. So we've seen Power View. Let me show you what Power Query looks like. So in order to get this data in, we said we need, to, we need to massage it a little bit. So behind, yeah, that's not zooming in great, is it? Behind the data model that's serving up these reports are a bunch of individual queries. And the concept here is staying consistent even in the new preview. So this is really, this is good stuff. So essentially, with respect to this particular analysis, we started with one file, this, this file called indications. And we had various information, but it was only at the zip code level. So then we started bringing in various demographic data so that we could relate a zip code to a county and a county to a metro area, to a state, and we kind of built out this geographic information and related it to each other in the data model. Um, we got some data from Wikipedia on crime statistics and that sort of thing. Um, we got another piece of data from just a file sitting in OneDrive and ended up relating it all together. The thing that is really cool about Power Query and that either you or either some of your business users might like it is that there's this concept of steps. So. When I highlight step one, this is what the source data looked like initially. And then after the next step, the state of the data looks like this. And then if you can see on row one, we actually have the headers. So we applied an operation to say the first row is headers. And then we applied an operation to change the types and remove the columns and reorder the columns and group the rows. And you get the idea. That's that kind of stuff that people do over and over and over. So the big thing about this tool is that, A, it's pretty easy. And it makes it so that a business user could get a new file, assuming that the format hasn't changed. And, and we all know the pain that goes along with that. But assuming no changes, you can then rerun these same steps on it and make it a repeatable operation, which is a very new thing for business users, right? Um, they're used to doing this with macros and, and that sort of thing. So once the data in Power Query is all there, there's this idea of where are you going to load the data. So each one of these queries here says um, X number of rows loaded. And what that means is it's loaded to the data model. So within Excel, the data model is Power Pivot, or the interface to the data model is Power Pivot. The data model is really just this embedded model in, inside of the cell, but that's just semantics. The big thing to be aware of 
And let me go to diagram view so you can kind of see. This particular one's actually a little bit ugly. Um, however, I think it's kind of representative. Business users don't care about creating a perfect star schema or a beautiful data model. They just want to get the data related and get it in a way that they can get a report on it that's hopefully correct, right? So um, the thing to know here, and, and one of the biggest limitations of using the data model with Excel like this, and even in the O365 version of this that we're going to talk about here in a minute, is that you're pulling in the data from wherever the source came from into your file. So within one single SLSX file is your report, your logic for Power Query, and the data itself. So anyone that has a governance type issues in your organization that says no data on laptops, uh, you know, all these kinds of rules and regulations around data extractions is going to want to tread very carefully with this type of a solution because it creates a redundant copy of the data, right? This is not connecting just a data source to your original data. It's really copying it. So if you read anything about some of the newest stuff that says with no data copying required, that's what they mean is this copy that's required in Power Pivot. Yes? So the question is, can it be set up to only run on a network so it's secured that way? So the answer is absolutely yes. So I'm actually working on a project that's in Toledo right now for uh, a huge company. And it's an IT-driven project. We're creating a Power Pivot model. And it's going to serve a bunch of users when they're delivered in the Power BI portal. We're not going to allow users to download that workbook because then they could get the data and they could do save as over and over and over. And it's going to be sitting up in just the portal, secured, um, and, and there'll be rules around it. So yeah, you can manage it. So my job, I think, is just to create this awareness of here's what's really happening with the, with the Power Pivot model inside of Excel. And this kind of changes when we get to the new stuff. That, that's, that's what it is inside of Excel. Yes. Ah. Yes. I, I'm thrilled you brought that up because I neglected to say something really important. So the question is about file bloat. So. This Power Pivot model is really different than data sitting inside of an Excel worksheet. So this Power Pivot model is running a, what they call a VertiPath engine, or X Velocity engine. It's a in-memory, column-based engine. So it, it compresses the data, they say, up to 10 or 12 times. So, but that really depends on the kind of data you have. So if you have a male-female column, what's it going to store? Two values, male and female, with pointers. If you've got a column of, say, amounts, well, it's going to store an awful lot of those. So the amount of compression that you get really depends on the type of data that you have. But this stuff here is compressed, whereas that worksheet data was not. So it's really different. And in fact, there's some rules about that when you get into the Office 365 environment. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but the file up there can only be 250 megabytes, of which only 10 megabytes can be inside the worksheet. Everything else has to be inside the compressed data model or you can't do it, which is another confusing thing to users because those Power Query queries I was showing you, on the interface it says load to worksheet or load to data model, and so that's another sort of learning thing for folks that are doing this that need to know, well, what's the difference between loading to the worksheet and loading to the data model? And you pretty much always want to load to the data model, so that's where it's compressed. Any other thoughts or questions? OK, so that's just a very quick whirlwind introduction into what it looks like inside of Excel. So architecturally, and I, I wish I could blow this up for you a little better, so I hope you can see it OK. So what we just went through is over here on the left, we've got a whole bunch of um, 
data sources, and we're bringing them inside the workbook, right? So inside the single workbook, we've got perhaps some Power Query operations, the Power Pivot data model, and then down here, some, some different data visualization elements, right? If it's in Excel, we're not in all likelihood doing anything besides putting it on some sort of file system, a folder somewhere. So here I'm just representing that, um, you know, where we would publish it, contrary to any of the other solutions, is somewhere on our, on our share. And then our only choice to interact with or view it is to open it in Excel and look at it that way, which kind of makes it different than any of our other solutions. So architecturally, it's the absolute simplest, and it's certainly the cheapest. And one thing I'm not doing in this talk is going down in the weeds with a bunch of stuff, but it does require Excel Professional Plus um, or the Professional Edition and that sort of thing. And um, there's also a, a new Click to Run Edition that um, is releasing new features faster than the old MSI install. So there's a bunch of rules around which one you can, uh, you can use for this. You definitely want the 64-bit version, and you definitely want to give your users as much RAM as possible. Um, Power Map in particular um, is the one thing that continues to work if you're in this Excel-only environment. In all other environments, it's, it's kind of out the door. In fact, I didn't even demo it to you because um, it's, it's very limited usage. I can show it to you, though, if we end up having time tonight. Some Power Query functionality will not work with this. And the reason for that is some Power Query functionality is associated with an Office 365 license. So unless you're logged in and associated to an Office 365 environment, there's certain things that aren't going to work, particularly something like sharing queries. So somebody like me that you know builds the I systems, I love the idea of a shared query. Let's say Sally down in accounting has this awesome query that she's done in Power Query to get a great, clean customer list. And she knows other people could use it. She could share it. Other people consume it. And, you know, you're at least a little step closer to one version of the truth, right? Because self-service BI, sort of all bets are off, are usually, that's one of the big risks when folks are doing things more in a self-service manner than a consolidated or corporate BI type of manner. Um, certainly no built-in data refresh, so we stored that data inside of Excel, so we've got to refresh it, right? So you would have to reopen the file in Excel and, and manually hit the refresh button. If you look online, there are certainly ways around that, um, just no built-in ways. You've got to kind of use a, use a third-party type of a thing or a, or a clever thing that I'm sure some of you know how to do. And we've, we've already talked about the whole thing with compliance to one Excel file. So before I go to the next step, which is adding SharePoint on-prem, any, any questions about these four add-ins and at least at a high level what they do? Yes. The question is, does it re require 2013 Excel? And it, pretty much mostly yes. There, there are some things you can do in 2010, and I don't have a great list off the top of my head what you can and can't do. But I can tell you there's a bunch of stuff that you can't do in Excel 2010. So it's a pretty much, yeah, if you're going to do most of the good stuff. hit on a huge point here is if everything works best with Excel 2013, how about the companies that aren't ready to move to Excel 2013? Because that's no small undertaking. I'm sure some of you manage that kind of stuff, and that's a big rollout, right? So there's a, there's a couple things here. One is if a company has already found that they're ready to upgrade to Office 365 for things like email and such then it becomes a little bit easier to roll out 
the upgrades to office because it's all tied together. So, so that's sort of thing number one that I'm seeing with people being a little bit closer to being ready. The other thing I'm seeing is, in fact, this Toledo customer I'm working with, most of their people are actually still on Excel 2007. But we've got a really small group of people that have been allowed to have Excel 2013 for purpose of developing this solution, publishing it up in the portal. And since nobody's going to be allowed to download this workbook, they're really just going to consume it via the web. And, it, and for the vast majority of users, they don't need the new Excel. It's just a handful of producers, if you will. Yes. Yes. But the new Power BI designer, so that's scenario number four I'm going to get to, a big reason that they're rolling out this independent tool to develop in Power BI is because not all companies are ready and willing to go to Office 2013. So it it's sort of just an independent download and it removes some of those obstacles. Okay, so flavor number two, taking just the same thing we talked about, but saying we want to deploy it to SharePoint. And this is the first thing we had for SharePoint, um, or I'm sorry, for Power BI, um, as far as sharing and so forth. So all the same stuff on the left, except we're going to cross out Power Query, because it's not supported in SharePoint 2013. The release cycles for the Excel or the Office team and the, re the release cycles for the SharePoint team are different. So inside of SharePoint, it doesn't understand what to do with an Excel file that contains Power Query. So if you cross that off the list, and we cross Power Map off the list, which we know that's not going to be compatible with anything else we talk about tonight. And guess what? We're also going to cross Power View off the list because same problem with the release cycles. It doesn't know what to do with a file that contains PowerView because it came along after. I have a great workaround for that, though. There is such thing as PowerView for SharePoint, but it's only on-prem. has nothing to do with Office 365 or SharePoint Online, on-prem only. So in this middle piece here, I've got some PowerView for SharePoint reports here um, that are pointing to a Power Pivot model. So that's a great workaround, and in fact, it's kind of better in a lot of ways than the Power View inside of Excel. So let's say we have a file with a Power Pivot model and perhaps some Excel pivot tables and charts and that sort of thing. Great. We can publish that up to SharePoint. And let's say we've got multiple document libraries. And, and here's one where we've got a Power Pivot model. And what this is depicting is multiple Power Pivot, I'm sorry, messed up my powers. Power View for SharePoint reports pointing to a Power Pivot model. Here's a reporting services report pointing to a Power Pivot model. Even a performance point report. How about another Excel report? What's fundamentally different about this than we just talked about a minute ago inside of Excel? Yes, it's inside the document library. But what we're doing here is what we call a workbook as a data source. This Power Pivot model that's really sitting inside of Excel in the document library can serve as a data source for other reports. This is huge. This means that we've separated the data model from the reports, and we can have multiple reports point to a single data model, and that's awesome. That's something that I'm about to take away from you when we talk about Office 365. Dan's going to get way clear as mud by the time we get through all this, I know. Um, so, so that's great. That means one data model change can affect many reports. Well, as long as the data model change is handled carefully, right? So that's a great thing. We love that. Um, we can do rendering inside the web browser and then reopen it inside of Excel if we need to, so that's great. We've got some data refresh activities that can be scheduled inside of SharePoint. So um, the most frequently that we can update this guy is once a day, and that's actually going to be true in all of the rest of the things we talk about tonight. Being a self-service type of a solution, 
it's not usually going to be the goal to keep it updated within an hour or a few minutes or whatever. Um, let's see. And then right over here, there's this really cool little thing. Power View for SharePoint has a couple of features that it has inside of SharePoint on-prem that none of the other, the, the Excel flavor doesn't. And one of them is that you can export it to PowerPoint um, and use it in a meeting and that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a cool little thing. And there's a couple other um, niceties. So in my mind, using Power View for SharePoint on-prem is not a bad thing. I, I like it better. I, I like it a lot. Actually, no. So um, the comment was, is it frozen once it gets to PowerPoint? And that's the really cool thing, is that they're integrated such that if you're still connected to your network where it can reach the Power Pivot model, it's still interactive. So it's really neat. So speaking of interactive, let me show you what this looks like. So this is a Power Pivot gallery. So what we're looking at here is a document library in SharePoint that has been optimized for Power Pivot. Um, and it really just means that it has these different um, thumbnail images and it's running on Silverlight. This is not HTML5 yet, it's still Silverlight. So as we scroll through here, we've got a few different types of documents that we see. One moment. So this top one here is an Excel workbook that also has a Power Pivot model inside of it. And I can tell that because there are three icons up here at the top right. One is to open an Excel workbook, one's to open a Power View report. Both of those would essentially be create a new blank report for me in either Excel or Power View, pointed to this as my data source. And then the third one is, is a scheduled data refresh. The next one is also an Excel workbook that's got a data model in it because we've got all three icons. The next one doesn't have any icons. And the way that I see these various pages here, I can tell this is Power View for SharePoint. So essentially, this has uh, got a number of different pages or views to the report itself. This next guy is just a data connection. So much like if you've deployed the BI in SharePoint before, this guy's just a connector to an on-premises analysis services model. And we can, again, create a new Excel report or a new Power View report using him as a data source. Yes? Yep. So the question was, are these OLEDB or ODBC type data connections? And this one here in particular is called a BISM connection. He's a BI semantic model, BISM type of a connection. Um, it is only very specific types that you can do inside of this Power Pivot Gallery. Um, a BISM connection, I think there's an RDL X maybe. Um, Type. So, so yeah, it's, it's not the generic ones that you're thinking of. It's very specific ones. So um, if we brought up, oops, didn't actually mean to click on him. Um, so this fella here, is kind of interesting. This is that same file that we looked at before that inside of Excel has the table of contents page, the page with the standard Excel charts and such, and then Power View pages. So, you know, here's my standard page, and it's Excel services, so it understands what to do with that one just fine. Um, by the time we get to the pages with the Power View, they're still there, but it doesn't, it doesn't know how to render them um, so it's not going to. So, so here's where instead of uploading a workbook with Power View embedded in it, where you'd, you'd want to do Power View separately. And I apologize, this is a different report, but um, I'm going to show you what Power View looks like here. And everything I'm going to show you here works the same in the web 
versus Power View inside of Excel. The only big difference is our authoring environment and our consumption environment is the web browser instead of the Excel client. So something that the last one I was showing you didn't um, highlight terribly well is this idea of um, cross-filtering and highlighting. So what I've done is I've highlighted one bar and it's, and it's cross-filtered everything else on the page. So we can see our, this is my garden center database. So I'm a, I'm a gardener, I putter in my backyard all the time. And so when I was building a demo a while back, what did I do? I built my own garden center. And I don't have a lot of sales. Unfortunately, I'm not making a lot of money, but you know, I got some garden data here. So, anyways, it, it, what this is telling us is our our plant sales. You know, more about half of all of our sales are, are green plants, for instance, and low growth and um, that kind of stuff. Um, we can we can kind of navigate through these different views or pages, and as we as we click on individual data points, you know, we get this, this cross-filtering type of behavior, which is really nice. Um, this guy up here is, you know, acting like a timeline. We have something very similar in traditional Excel as well. Um, but one thing down here that this is using um, is, is literally images, you know, row by row that are inside the database to kind of show them in a, in a table. So it, it does handle images really well. Probably the last thing I'll take the time to show you, because it wasn't in the other one, if we've got a, um, a scatter chart here that we can also lay a time axis on, what we can do is play it over time. And you know, you'd expect a garden center to be very seasonal with ups and downs a lot, and you can see how something changes over time. And that can be useful for sort of detecting outliers or, or that sort of thing. So, got some caveats for SharePoint on prem. The great thing is that we can do direct access to some data sources. So, we saw that data connection that went to an analysis services. Um, data source, so we can just put reports straight on top of it. So that means we don't have to copy data in Power Pivot first. Person with me with my hat on loves that, right? It permits that idea of workbooks as a data source where even if it is in Power Pivot, we can point multiple reports to it, which is great. In the next thing we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about how they're all trapped in one file, so you can't have multiple people work on it. If you've got to pass it around from one person who knows how to do the data model to somebody else who's doing the reports, they have to share a single file. And that's not true here, so that's great. Um, we can go all the way up to the SharePoint limit of two gigs for a file size, so that's great. That's quite a bit of data in the compressed data model. Um, one thing we haven't really talked about yet is what if you outgrow a power pivot model? What if it works great for a little while and then it, it gets larger in size? and you really need to keep using it. And that's when you can upsize it to an analysis services tabular model. There's a really nice pattern there where you can um, let it grow up, if you will. Um, somewhat of a downside is that it's still relying on Silverlight. Um, it'll be interesting to see if in the next major release of SharePoint, if that changes. Power Query is not supported. Um, one great thing is there's great, greater system oversight than we have in any of the next two things we're going to talk about. Um, I wasn't actually all that impressed the first time I saw it until I didn't have it anymore in some of our other solutions. And there's some really nice dashboarding and, and insight for system administrators as to who's running the reports, who's uploading cloud pivot models, how often the queries are being pulled, all that kind of stuff. Downside, if any of you have ever been tasked with setting up SharePoint, and specifically SharePoint BI, you know that it takes a little bit of time and energy to get it going, unless you're a pro at it, and I'm certainly not. Uh, so, with that, I'm going to move to the next thing, but before I do, any comments or questions about Power Pivot with on-prem SharePoint? We all want to take a break now? Okay.
Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes. Yep. So the question is, is, is Power BI included with Office 20? I'm sorry, with um, with Office 365 and Excel 2013, and um, kind of. So with Office 365, you've got to buy a Power BI license, and it's approximately an average forty dollars a month per user. Um, so it's basically an add-on. So if you have deployed an E3 or an E4. That means you already have one of the major prerequisites, which is SharePoint Online. So it, it kind of needs your Office 365 license, a SharePoint Online license, and a Power BI license. With respect to being included in Office 2013, most of it is. So um, as of right now, Power Query is still in preview, actually. So it's a separate download. Power Pivot and Power View are native, so you really just have to go to the menu and enable them. Power Map is the same, except it also requires an Office 365 license. It's kind of one of their first hammers to say, but interestingly, you can't view it out there. So, so it gets really convoluted and lots of rules on what works with what. Any other questions or comments before we take a quick break? Okay, when we come back, we'll talk about the Office 365 piece and then the new piece for the new dashboard stuff. So that'll be, that'll be good stuff. While everybody's getting scheduled, one of the things that, can't find them, fella came up and made me realize something that maybe I didn't um, spend a moment on earlier. Everything we're talking about here is a self-service BI type of solution. So there's lots more other things in the Microsoft world we can do for bigger scale corporate BI. So when we're talking about limitations and we're talking about file sizes and that kind of stuff, keep in mind that we're talking about the smaller scale stuff. And the very last slide I think I'm going to show is use cases for this. And perhaps I should have started with it. but. Um, Keep in mind that this is not going to replace the vast majority of what you're doing in your organization. It's just for certain situations, right? Um, one of the things that um, I see it, for instance, the, co the company I'm helping right now actually is an SAP BW shop, but yet we're using a small-scale Microsoft BI solution for a very targeted rollout. Um, in a very targeted analysis because we can roll it up much faster than augmenting the big solution. So just wanted to qualify that. Okay, um, any other questions that popped up during the break? All right, well, thank you all for coming back. I'm so excited we didn't lose most of you. Um, so now we're going to move on to the Office 365 part. So this stuff was initially rolled out around a year ago now. So we've had um, a few changes. Um, what I will tell you is that this is the biggest thing that's apt to change in the future in favor of item four that we're going to talk next. So um, my understanding is that pretty much everything we see here, we're going to still have available, but in another form. And I don't have much information on that yet. but. Um, as it stands, this Office 365 um, solution that we're going to talk about now is available and is um, out of preview at the moment. So high level wise, same thing on the left, the same Excel workbook um, with the various add-ins, so Excel being the authoring environment. This time we're going to cross off Power Map. And in this particular environment, everything else works. So we can have our Power Query, our Power Pivot, our Power View, and our Excel. Here's where we're going to publish it to Power BI. So Power BI in this case is um, essentially an app. It's a SharePoint app running inside of Office 365. Um, and so what we have then within every single site that you have in SharePoint Online, you can have a Power BI site. And 
And that's where you can publish various reports. You can schedule your data refreshes. Um, you can use Q&A, so I'm going to show you what that is. That's that Bing-like search type functionality to render a report on the fly. And then there's this idea of the Power BI Admin Center. So here's where you definitely need at least a fairly technical person, if not an absolute IT person, a fairly technical person to help. Because in order to manage the data refreshes of the data that's getting into those Power Pivot workbooks, you need to set up um, a gateway. It's a data management gateway um, that reaches into, it's, a, it's an agent that gets installed on your on-premises server, configured to reach you know, that SQL server or that Oracle server or whatever. Um, and then you've got to set up data sources in the admin center and then the data refresh operations reach through the rows. So that's something that your business users, even if they're handling the Excel side of things, probably aren't going to be handling the gateway type of stuff. With the Office 365 component, we have a mobile app. So in addition to using the web to render the reports, we can also use mobile app. This one is a Windows 8.1 app. And it is pretty limited, um, contrary to the next thing that we're going to talk about, the new Power BI preview. And that one, they rolled out an iPad app first. With this one, we have the Windows 8 app first and, and no other platforms right now. Down here at the bottom is kind of representing getting data from either the cloud or, or your corporate data from the data management gateway. I've got another talk where I dive way deeper into this kind of stuff. And for this talk, I just want you to know it exists, and it's a prerequisite to set all this stuff up. A couple of other really interesting things that can happen in this environment when you do set up the gateway is if we come all the way back over here to the beginning, let's say someone's working in Power Query inside of Excel, and they want to do a search for organizational data. So today, if someone is trying to find, let's say, some marketing data, how do they do it? Well, they probably go ask their coworker or whatever if they don't already know a database name or a connection string or whatever, right? What this is working on is deploying the idea of a data catalog to where you can set up data feeds that are, are hooked to this gateway that's all set up. And then a user in Power Query can do a search and say, I'm looking for marketing data from my organization and pick it up that way. And it's a really neat way of sharing data in a much more user-friendly way. And then um, there's also the idea we mentioned briefly earlier of a shared query. So same idea. Um, maybe they picked up that data, that marketing data, through the data catalog, and they did some various changes to it. They could republish it and share it. So there's some lines kind of going in and out of the data catalog that kind of create this thing as being all very cyclical. Um, and that's some of the more interesting things we can do with this sort of environment. Yes? So the question is, with the data catalog, is there a possibility the links will disappear? And absolutely yes. So with the idea of the data catalog, the, the power is really with the business user that shared it, 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 assuming it's a shared power query. If it's a feed coming from the data source that was set up in the Power BI Admin Center, that's probably pretty stable. But yeah, if the, um, if the business user that shared it decides to either change it, take it down, or whatever, um, yeah, that certainly could have some impact. But they have done some, um, uh, in fact, remind me, I'll show you, um, there's a page in there called My Power BI, and if others are using the queries you have shared, it shows you who's using them and how often. So if the user was cautious enough about looking at it, they could see who's using it and who would be impacted. So this here is a Office 365 Power BI site. So at the top, we're seeing some featured reports. Next, we have some featured questions. And then we have a variety of reports across a variety of document libraries. 
So in one respect, this is similar to what we saw with SharePoint on-prem, um, but it has a really different look and feel. And there's one really big fundamental difference here, and that is right here, this demographics and social media is a document library inside the site. This next one, healthcare, is a document library inside the site. So essentially, we have one Power BI site per SharePoint site that crosses document libraries. And that's really different from what we have in SharePoint on-prem. We kind of have to custom create something to cross. That Power Pivot Gallery that I showed you before is one document library. And this is broader than that. And that's a really cool thing, I think, for categorizing reports. It also makes it so that if we wanted to set security on these document libraries differently for sets of users, yet still run it through the same site we could. Or multiple sites, you know, however you prefer to manage it. So it's, that's kind of a big fundamental difference. So um, let's look at Q&A a moment. So um, this right here says number of cases for 2013 by age group. So if I click on that, that's going to take us to the Q&A page. doing, we uh, typed in number of cases by age group. It's taking this particular workbook, it says the results are from drug safety analysis.xlsx. And if I needed to, there's a drop down here and I can say, no, 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 I wanted it from a different workbook. It's running this query on the fly. So this bar chart here that it rendered, I didn't publish as part of that workbook. It's doing that on the fly. And so, you know, if I wanted to, um, you know, I could change with the type of visualization and so forth. I could start saying, oh, you know what, let me, uh, let me change some things. Let me add, let me add different, different things and so forth. Um, so this is a really interesting way of making it so that you don't have to um, publish every single permutation of every single report that needs to be slightly different. It's also a really interesting thing for if you've got, I've had two customers now talking to me about how excited they are about using this for talking with sales customers and they're, they've got some set of reports that are pre-prepared that they review with the customer, but then the customer says, well, what about such and such? And, and they have this ability to at least try to figure it out on the fly. Um, so this, this Q&A functionality is something Microsoft is investing very, very, very heavily in, and we're going to see more and more things come um, out from, from this angle of things. Um, let's see. Um, Beyond that, um, this is SharePoint Online, so a lot of what we would expect to see um, in, in SharePoint On-Prem we would see here. So currently, in Office 365, these are all still being rendered with Silverlight. Down here at the bottom right is this small icon that says to switch to the new HTML5 view. So essentially, that just flipped it, so that's in what they would refer to as the public preview mode um, for the HTML5 view. So that's that's kind of the new the new focus. So let's talk about a few key points. We hit on this briefly earlier, licensing. So not only do we need the Office 365 license, we need a SharePoint Online license and a Power BI license. Um, that gets to be a little expensive, but um, I would imagine that those prices are, are negotiable as you work with your Microsoft rep. 
The good news is that associating it with your Office 365 license allows all the Power Query functionality to work. So earlier when we were talking Excel only, and we said certain things like searching for your corporate data or sharing queries, all that stuff that's associated with the data catalog, it works because you have it hooked up to the Office 365 license. Scheduled data refresh. Um, one comment on scheduled data refresh. This is a multi-tenant service in Office 365, and at the moment there is no offering to purchase a single tenant service where you and you alone are, have these dedicated resources. And where we see that mostly is da scheduled data refresh. So let's say I scheduled my health habit workbook to be refreshed at 2 a.m. Usually I see it refreshed within about a half an hour after that. And that's because, you know, it's just going to perform the refresh operation as soon as it has enough resources to do so after your scheduled time. So just something to kind of be aware of there. Because at SharePoint Online, we can do some cool things like versioning and approvals. Um, usually, I like to recommend, um, and this is true for SharePoint On-Prem as well, even though I didn't mention it, um, at least three maybe versions for your files, but not more than that. If you implement versioning on a document library, I thought until last week that the default was 10 versions, but I saw a file that didn't have a maximum set, had 12 already and then 13. So, so we, we bumped that back down to five, and the reason that we want to limit it is because in SharePoint Online you buy your space, right? And these files add up to 250 megs a piece. Every single version is, is using a lot of space. So you probably don't want to store a ton of versions. But this is Excel. And we're running data models and stuff in Excel, so these files do get dropped once in a while. So you definitely want versioning. The mobile app we talked about. Um, in this environment, we are absolutely confined to everything's in one single Excel file. So, from my standpoint, the biggest downside to that is, let's say, you have some reports you want to release to set of users A, and a slightly different set of reports you want to release to user B. That's two reports, right? Guess what that means? It means two models, two files, two sets of calculations to keep intact, two files to keep in sync and do data refreshes on. Ugh. So, um, so that works in a very small scale, if only two, maybe three to keep in sync, but beyond that, it's awful. So, um, so keep that in mind as you're thinking about using it. Um, whenever I start to hear different reports for different user populations, my skin starts to go, oh, well, you know, how do we really want to handle that? So as it stands right now, the best thing to do, if you can, is all the different reports in a single file and, you know, hopefully not too many tabs. While we're on the subject of we're kind of sort of hitting on security here, right, with different user populations, with all of them that we've talked about so far, it's file level security. So either you have access to the file or you don't. There's no concept of user A runs it and they're going to see divisions 2, 4, and 8, and user B runs it and sees something different. This is not that type of system. Either you see it or you don't. Make sense? Okay, Power Map. We're not going to see it in the web. I'm told there's lots of technical reasons for that, um, but it, it would be there still if you downloaded the Excel file and opened it. We hit on this briefly earlier. Um, in Office 365, although you can upload a file that's up to 2 gig, Power BI only supports a file up to 250 megabytes, um, and of which it, almost all of it has to be in that compressed data model. So little, little user training issue there. We talked a, a little bit about that crossing document libraries with seeing things on the page, which is kind of cool. Office 365 itself, for support reasons, says to use our services, you've got to be using 
I think it's either the newest or, or next newest version of Internet Explorer or the latest Safari or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, OSs need to be updated and so forth. So that's a big blocker for the organizations that still have the older machines, older OSs, that kind of stuff. So they do that so that they can provide consistent and reliable support, um, but it is a blocker for adoption for some organizations that, that don't have newer computers and are a ways away from that. And we've already kind of briefly talked on this as a multi-tenant service and to accordingly expect that. So with Office 365, in order to get your data refreshed, you have to have this data management gateway in place. That is not true with on-prem SharePoint. Um, and it's also currently not true for the new Power BI preview, but something similar will probably be true for that. At the moment, there's no APIs specifically available for Power BI for Office 365. I've got one customer in particular that really, really, really found that limiting. Um, I'll hold off from telling the story because it's getting a little late. Um, but that's a big thing they're changing with the next one. Also, very disappointingly, there's very little insight for the system administrator. I cannot go into Office 365 now as a site admin and say, how often is this report being run and by whom? And, and you know, that's information that we often really need to know if it's not for some sort of, um, you know, mandatory reason. We want to know which workbooks are popular and, and being used a lot and maybe a candidate for you know, being brought into our corporate PI solution of some sort. And then, this is this is really true for a lot of stuff these days as we move more and more to the cloud, but we have lots of dependencies on active internet connections and great bandwidth, right? So, I don't know, you guys are IT people, I don't have to tell you that one. Okay, so before I switch to the last and final new stuff that's in preview, any comments or questions about Office 365? Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> That's a good. Yeah, he's talking about big issues with, okay, we're on IE 11 now, but then a patch comes through and breaks a bunch of stuff, and we have to roll back to IE 10, and yeah, I, I don't know what to say about that, because that is a really rough issue, um, and especially for the organizations that say, hey, our standard is IE, and we don't even allow other browsers as an alternative, so yeah, definitely a challenge for sure. Yes. So the question is ad hoc queries for an existing SQL database. There's a couple different thoughts here. So one is, and, and this one comes to mind first because I'm actively talking to a customer about this. You could expose the, let's say you've got some SQL views, for instance, that, you're, that you want to release as feeds in your gateway or your data source, really, that goes through the gateway, they could search for those using Power Query and then bring them in accordingly. That, that precludes them from having to know, it, it, it takes them directly to the views, but then they don't have to know, you know, oh, this is my database name and yada, yada, yada. So that would be one great way to make it easy for people to find these views um, based on wild cards. Um, if they do a search for, in fact, here, let me show you what this looks like. If we do Power Query Online Search, what you 
can do is specify So here it came up with three results related to the organization and then a whole bunch of results publicly. Um, and so for instance, this here, this average temp per month per city is just a silly little query that I shared. But this would be kind of what they would find and these terms that they search for would be found in either the name or the column headings or the description. Yes, so the, the answer is about security on the data that's available. So let's think about this here. Right, so if in fact you deployed it that way, if we go and we look at the admin center, which is something I should briefly show you anyways, There's essentially two sets of permissions in Office 365 related to Power BI. One is on the files themselves. Who can see this file and can you edit it, can you view it, and so forth. And then there's permissions associated to individual data sources that end up connecting the files. And theoretically, one data source can serve many files, right? So if I take a look at There's, there's a few things going on here. So this particular um, data source is pointing to a SQL Server. Um, sorry, I would zoom in on this, but I don't think it's... Nope. Um, there's, there's these various checkboxes. This one up here allows the um, data refresh to happen. And this one down here enables no data feed, which is, which is what we're talking about. But more to the point here is users and groups. So these are the people that are allowed to see the O data feed. And if they get to it this way, hang on a second here, let me think. Yep. There are, there's two boxes here. And I need to test this. The bottom one, I think that the credentials it's going to run under is the, what's in the connection info here which is actually a big important thing, right? Um, one of my other talks that I do, I walk through this whole thing of um, Sally from Division B or whatever works on this workbook. For weeks is ready to upload it. She sets up a refresh schedule. It finds um, which data source and gateway to use. It already has credentials set up. Guess what, they're not hers. And it, you know, shows lots more information than she's used to seeing the next time it refreshes. So I go through this whole spiel on that. For this, though, there is this other checkbox right in the middle that is searchable in Power Query, enable connections to data source directly with users' credentials from Power Query. So I think what you would need to do is truly have separate data sources to where the context is running really is the user's credentials by itself here. Um, so, so there's kind of two different ways to, to handle that and you might need to have multiple. While we're on the subject, and I know we only have 10 minutes left, so I won't make too much um, fuss of this, but a couple things um, to know about. The default provider type in the Power BI Admin Center is the native, I'm sorry, I think it's actually the OLEDB. Inside of Power Pivot, if a user doesn't have SQL Server or the native client provider installed, it's going to use OLEDB, but if they have any sort of SQL Server components installed, it's going to use native client. Guess what? You upload that workbook, you set up a refresh schedule, it says, oh, I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to go find which data source I should use for refresh, because guess what? You don't control that, but that's not the topic of tonight's talk. If the provider doesn't match, it will fail. So I have a bunch of stuff on my blog about what it needs to what it needs to do, but be very cautious because it tries to help you a lot in what it's going to do here because it's a self-service type of type of solution, right? Okay, anything else before I hit the last new one? 
Okay, so the new one. Some really fundamental differences here. We can, if you want, you can start with your Excel workbook. We're going to block out two things. We're going to block out Power Math, no surprise. We're going to block out Excel. In today's preview of the new Power BI, whatever the new Power BI is going to be called, Excel elements, the pivot tables, the pivot charts, the cube formulas can't be seen. The only reporting tool it can see is Power View. So I think that screams to us there's some future here in Power View being the predominant reporting tool. Okay, the other thing we could do is use a Power BI designer tool. It's a separate download. Its purpose is for users that don't have Excel 2013 or they want an independent tool. The other thing that I have heard is that we're going to see updates to the tool much, 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 much faster through the Power BI Designer. So I think we can expect to see over time um, disparity in the feature sets of what you can do in Excel versus what you can do in the Power BI Designer. But it's also new. We don't know yet. So two authoring environments, but we can deploy to the Power BI Preview. Essentially, we have three different things in the Power BI Preview. We can see dashboards, we can see reports, and we can see data sets. So those are kind of the three big things. So you could think of the data sets as being Power Query plus Power Pivot, and, and really the end result of Power Pivot, right? Um, reports are the Power View reports, and dashboards are your personal dashboards, and you can take items from Oh, we want to pin this chart from this report onto my dashboard and this chart from that report and kind of form your own personal dashboard that's a conglomerate of things. So what we're looking at here is actually a sample that they have. It's called the Retail Analysis Sample. So um, this is all the different items that have been pinned. Let's say I click on this particular one. What it's going to do is it's going to take me to the original report that that item came from. So, um, you know, just like we saw in the other flavors of Power View, you know, it, it's still very interactive between items and so forth. Um, if we said, oh, I really like this, this pie chart. Um, every visual has a, a little pin item. So we'll say, oh, okay, I want to pin that. And this dashboard is read only, your changes will not be saved. Okay, fine. Um, huh. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of how you end up compiling items on your dashboard is by pinning individual items. As of right now, it's got a huge limitation though. There's not any filters on your dashboard page. So kind of what you see is the state of that chart at you know, when you pinned it or, or what it is now. I'm actually not really sure, but it, to me, it's a great first step, but it's not really ready for prime time use just yet. But that's okay. It's a public preview that's a month old, so, you know. Um, Microsoft's doing a, a really different thing these days, right, and showing us these tools as they're maturing, which makes somebody like me get really antsy because I want so much more very quickly, but then again, we don't have to wait two years to see anything new, so that's our trade-off. Um, let's see, over here for reports, um, these are all just Power View pages, so this particular one right here um, that I uploaded, the this one right here, it has some Excel elements that are just being hidden. So I have a big, big, big wish list that at some point we're going to get the Excel elements back to where we can see them in the, in the Power BI preview. And then down here for data sets, really what it does is it shows us, here's that field list, and lets us start building, you know, a brand new report and so forth. So, key points just so that we kind of wrap up. Uh, it's got a, that big focus on the personal dashboard with, with the pinned items, right? We have this new authoring environment. It's 
so far got one connector to on-prem data that doesn't require it to make that pit stop with a copy and power pivot first. And right now it's analysis services in tabular mode, not the multi-dimensional cube, at least yet. Um, but that's, that's a good start. Um, and that's important to somebody like me because then I can say, oh good, I have my central version of the data. Put as many reports as you want on it, I don't care. I just don't want copies of the data over and over and over and over, right? It's all HTML5, not Silverlight, so that's a great step forward. iPad mobile app is released. I actually don't own an iPad, so I haven't played with it, but I hear it's a lot better than the Windows app for Office 365. This is huge. The data is published separately from the reports. So down here, uh, oh, I haven't fired it up. That's okay. We're running out of time, so I won't. I won't take the time. But the um, the um, Power BI Designer, when you upload it, it it doesn't. Um, it's uploaded separately, so we can point reports and reuse a model and that kind of stuff, which is awesome. That's what we lost in Office 365 that we had in SharePoint on-prem. Um, rumors, reporting services. So there's some organizations that have a massive investment in reporting services, right? Um, back in May, so this is almost pushing a year, there was an announcement at a Microsoft conference that reporting services would be part of Power BI. So, you know, hoping that's true. If so, that'll be really, really great. There's also a huge push towards a lot of APIs for um, the new Power BI platform. And as a matter of fact, even things like custom connectors. So you want to get access to um, MongoDB or whatever. Instead of waiting for Microsoft to release connector after connector after connector, um, they're going to allow developers to develop APIs and connectors and share them and, you know, create this huge community, which is going to be really cool. I'm looking forward to see how this plays out. Okay, so use cases, um, I think we can kind of just say that, you know, small scale items, um, prototyping, an infrequent one-time type of analysis. Um, you know, we can talk for half an hour on self-service BI and corporate BI and governance, and I can go on and on, as you've probably guessed. I can talk a lot, right? Um, so I'll, I'll kind of hold it there. And let me just pop this up. Um, presentations and downloads page is where you can find these um, materials. Questions? Yes. Yes. So it kind of wasn't working for me, but yeah, it actually is. So on this, let me go find a better dashboard. So here, um, these, each one of these items was pinned from somewhere else originally. And so yeah, see how I can move them around? And then each one of them has, see this little X? And OK, I can just remove him and that kind of stuff. So it, it's, um, yeah, it seems like a really nice start to building nice dashboards, assuming we can get filters and that kind of stuff coming along soon. And that was a good question. You've been asking good questions all night. So heads up. What else? All right, what else? Anything else before we break for the evening? All right, let's see. You fellow way back there that's been asking good questions, this could be dangerous. Here we go. Not bad, I hit the table. Um, well, thank you all very much for coming out tonight. I hope that I didn't scare you too much and at least, you know, gave you some things to, to know what to look for as you're investigating and so forth. So um, thanks a ton. Have a great night.